Okay, then I think we'll start if we can, Dominico, and if it's okay with you, uh, Aki. Thank you very much all for joining us today. The numbers are slowly still going up, but I will begin if I may, because we have to finish at 5.30 sharp. Thank you for all joining us for this, the second in our series on LGBTQ Iran. Today, we're going to have Dominico Ingenito of UCLA. He'll be looking at obscene and sacred dimensions of medieval Persian poetry with a focus on Saadi, on whom he has written a very important study, Beholding Beauty, Saadi of Shiraz and the Aesthetics of Desire in Medieval Persian Poetry. This was published by Brill in 2020, and I'm happy to say as Aki has put in to the actual, um, has put in to the chat section, uh, a, a special code for you to get a discount on it, which is till today, later this evening, and if we're lucky, they're gonna extend it. Now, what we're doing is just for a bit of housekeeping, we're gonna keep the chat closed other than Aki's announcements. Please, any questions you have, we will uh, address in the Q&A section to Domenico after his talk. And uh, I don't wanna waste any more time. I'd like to hand over to Domenico when you're ready. And I believe you have a PowerPoint for us as well. I do, yes. Thank you so much for your kind introductions, uh, Roya John. Uh, I'm very, very happy to be here virtually with all of you. I see many, many known no names and friends and colleagues joining us today. I'm very grateful. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, I will start sharing my screen to uh, the PowerPoint. You can see it. Here it is. You can see my PowerPoint, right, Roya? Yes. Absolutely. So this is, I have here the this is the print edition of the book here. And uh, the title, as you as said, is Beholding Beauty. Uh, I will be talking about difficult aspects of, of medieval Persian poetry and specifically of Sadi of Shiraz um, lyric output. Um, when I talk, when I, when I say there are several, of course, there are several ways to refer to what I call the obscene or the pornographic. And anything that I refer to as obscene or pornographic in this context means the explicit mention of intimate body parts or actions, sexual actions, mainly that sort of the mainstream higher registers of the, the, the in this literary heritage should not mention. So this is the main one. I, I, I say this because some friends in the past have told me, oh, but studies of obscene poems are not really pornographic because there is some some degree of beauty and balance in the way that he uses his language, uh, it's, it's, it's not, it's not a, a derogatory term to me. So I say pornographic and, and uh, obscene while respecting also the literary value of, of this heritage. The main, the main question for me in this book, specifically in the third chapter of this book, which is dedicated to this very specific topic, is the connection between the higher aspiration of the soul, the quest, for beauty and the connection between divine beauty and physical beauty and the lower registers of, of Sadi's poetry. So we'll see how these two levels can interact and inform each other in, in different ways. So for instance, take this, this, this beautiful lines by Sadi, by his little poems on Ghazals. I'm imprisoned by your snare, subjugated by your hands, astounded by sensing you and bewildered when lauding you. What do these communicate? What kind of presence is, are these lines trying to evoke for us? What kind of evocation takes place right, in, this, in this appeal to a kind of beauty that is affecting the senses and at the same time is transcending the senses? And what happens when we compare this kind of register, this kind of depictions with lines like the following one. And I apologize if I'm going to use kind of language that you know, some of you might, might find a bit upsetting, but uh, you already know what we're going to talk about today. So I apologize in advance for this. Uh, last night, I said to myself that I would repent from love as the time has come for me to leave this world. But then I repented of these words as the memory of that seductive beloved came to my mind. 
the mention of his Rs I brought to my tongue and water emerged from the mouth of my cock. And uh, I will try to show that this kind of language, this kind of depictions are intimately connected with the higher registers, with the higher depictions of desire in Sadi's poetry. Uh, it sounds like a, a forced connection in this moment, but I hope that you know, through these brief uh, notes, the remarks I'm sharing with you, everything will make more or less more, more sense. Um, if you're here, you probably know more or less, so you heard about Sadi Shiraz. If you haven't, it's not a problem. Uh, we can safely say that he's probably one of the most important um, pre-modern poets of Iran uh, or the Persian speaking world or the Persianate world. Uh, he flourished during the 13th century. He most likely studied the Nizamiya school in Baghdad, a very uh, important institution at the time. And he was loosely attached to different kinds of Sufi mystical orders probably the sort of idea, but in a very loose way. And he saw political and literary patronage throughout his life. Now, the erotic and political aspects of Sadi's poetry are, uh, the, aspect, are the dimensions of, of his biography that have not been highlighted enough in the scholarship uh, up to this point. You know, there are there have been publications that try to approach a few, some of the aspects of, of his political Activity, his connections with his patrons, uh, but but there is, we're still we're still trying to understand what kind of direct connections he had with his patrons, and and uh, it's 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 possible to glean most of these biographical details from his major works, which are the famous Sadi Nome or Bustan, and then the Golestan, the Rose Garden, and the collection of lyric poems, love poems known as Ghazals. I call them erotic poems. When I say erotic, I do not mean obscene. I do not mean pornographic. I just mean erotic um, by um, the etymological meaning of the word, right? So amatory poetry, poems about love. There are three or four collections. And this is the main focus of today's um, conversation, the obscene works of Shabisat, probably composed in the early 1260s. And you will see they were dedicated to, to uh, young princes, the patrons, we will talk about also the Sadi's patrons, the Salguri dynasty, the Atabeg of Fars, who were controlling all the uh, southern and central areas of today's Iran, uh, what is today Iran, and the Persian Gulf, and, and they, they were renowned also all the way to, to the east of, the easternmost fringes of the Indian Ocean. In the book, I try to reconstruct all the intellectual networks that surrounded uh, Sadi's, um, Sadi's life and his activity as a, as a poet, as a, as a, as a mystic, as a, as a Sufi as well. And, and I do not bring the, the actual image from an important manuscript that is kept in Paris, uh, the Bibliothèque Nationale de France, in which uh, I discovered, and I, I tried to reconstruct all the whole story behind it. It, it, it. it shows that Sadi, toward the end of his life, was granted by the Jovedi family a Sufi lodge, a Hanva. So it's important to know that he was connected with, with, the, with the spiritual and the mundane uh, circles of his time. His poems were re recited uh, at court and also in Sufi lodges. We will talk about this as well. Uh, I've been relying mostly on the oldest manuscripts that, that uh, um, record the, the, uh, all the works by Sadi. So this is a beautiful uh, index of Sadi's works uh, in the manuscript that was copied most likely toward the, last, the final years of the 13th century, the first decade of the 14th century. You see here in Persian all the titles of these works, like all these, these globes rotating around each other. Um, I will start discussing the problem of homosociality, friendship, and homoeroticism, right? Um, this is a lecture series that focuses on LGBTQ plus in Iran and the Persian world. Um, I would like to emphasize from the outset that when we talk about homosexuality, we usually refer to 
the modern Western conceptualization as, a, as an identity, right? That has been then re, uh, re uh, acquired or acquired and percolating in different cultures, in different ways of also inhabiting same sex desires, right? So when I talk about homo homoeroticism in, in, in the case of pre modern Persian poetry, I try to refer to a, a broader, more nuanced set of values, practices, desires, and literal expressions of these desires, right? So it's not a matter of identity, it's more of a matter of, of expression of desires. Also considering that in most cases, the homoerotic content of the poems that we find in this tradition do not necessarily reflect the sexual inclinations of, of the authors. Okay. At times they might have coincided, but the time is it's part of a, a, a literary uh, rhetorical strategy, a literary tradition that represents the ideal of desire, especially in a mystical context, through same-sex desire, right? Up to a point in which a, a woman, for instance, who was contemporaries of, of uh, Hafez Shirazi, her name was, was Jahan Malek Khatun, enacted homoerotic desire by pretending to be a man in love with a younger man, even without hiding her own biological sex. So it's interesting to see how in Sadi, in all Sadi's works, we see this homoeroticism that is part of uh, the way that the appreciation of the world's beauty is, is described and is conceived of. In, this, in, in his most important work known as the Rose Garden of Golestan, you see this beautiful um, vignette anecdote that explains why the poet decided to write this book. This will be the topic of my next book on the, on the quest for experience through the narrations that are found in the Golestan. And you can see also how in the, in the first generations of painters who, who try to, to represent visually these stories, this homosocial content is never necessarily erotic, but it does include possibilities of eroticism, not necessarily from a sexual point of view, but there is this, this homosocial appreciation of beauty and conversation, sohbat, adab, by the art of, of relying on, on etiquette and aesthetics at the same time. So you can see here, for instance, in this very opening of the Golestan, so he uh, discusses how we decide to spend the night with one of our friends in the middle of a fragrant garden. It was an enchanting and inspiring location surrounded by lush trees. The flowers on the ground looked like sparkles of iridescent glass and the necklace of the Pleiades seemed to shine on the branches. The following morning, my friend filled his robe with roses, fragrant herbs, hyacinths and fresh mint. I told him, this is Sadi talking to his friend. As you know, fresh roses do not last forever and the rose garden never fulfills its promises. Philosophers say that the heart should not cover things that do not last. My friend asked, how does one cope then? With the delight of the beholders and the graceful presence of our companions, I shall compose a rose garden book, Kitabi Golestani, whose petals will not be destroyed by the cold winds of winter. My friend dropped all the roses and grabbed my robe saying, a virtuous man ought to keep his promises. And it's interesting to see how I'm sharing with you. I've, I've, I've had a wonderful conversation since my book was released with art historians. And I'm learning a lot from our colleagues who work in this field because we're trying now to make sense of how this literary tradition was represented decades after uh, or centuries after Sadi's death. And it's interesting to see how this encounter here, if you look on the left, this is a beautiful image is one of the first images that represents this the, this anecdote this, the, uh, the, the, that, that justifies the so this decision of composing the Golestan. And you can see how his friend here is depicted as a young boy that is very similar to the beloved, the ideal beloved, the ideal macho that we find in, in the in the neurotic depictions of desire in um, during the the early Timurid period is this specific uh, Folio, the margin is from an anthology dedicated to Sultan Iskandar in Shiraz, probably co copied in uh, 1410, 1411, it's found in Lisbon, the Gulbenkian Foundation today. This homoerotic component is also part of 
a general broader discourse on power, on political power, on sacred power. So on Marathism in Sadi and on the basis of a tradition, right, that precedes Sadi and Sadi somehow re reinvents this tradition and connects it with connects it with with the sacred and 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 uh, and the cardinal um, is a tradition that conceives of power as an erotic act, as an erotic ideal, as an erotic communication, as, a, as, as an erotic form of communication. You can see here, for instance, so the describing uh, these beauties of Turkic origin that are found in Shiraz at the time of the Mongol invasion. And he says, where this beauty perhaps created by pure mercy as they appease the soul, cherish the heart and enlighten the eyes. Behold here all the grace with which Adam's clay was molded. Behold here the spirit that was blown through Adam's body. These marks of beauty are so charming on the uh, visage and this fine beard that sprouts was so elegantly designed. And it's interesting to see how, for instance, this manuscript was copied during the, uh, the 1350s in Tabriz is the, is, the, is the manuscript that shows of the importance of the influence of Sadi in the generation of poets who imitated him. Omar Tabrizi was in Tabrizi, was slightly younger than, than Sadi, and he imitated this homoerotic panegyrics by praising the rulers of his time. So in this case, Razan Khan, who was Ilkhani's ruler who asked Omar Tabrizi to craft a response to Sadi's poem. So it's interesting to see how the connection between power and homoeroticism and spirituality is something that created a legacy that survived Sadi's death. And, and Omar here, this response to Sadi for the pleasure of Ghazan Khan uh, recited, they are, they are the solace of the heart and the light of our eyes. Their bodies were perhaps craft, created from fine soul the soul envies the beauty of their eyes in which the superior spirit was blown through divine light. Maybe the guardian of paradise was drunk and asleep when they took their chances and fled away from heaven. Not at all. From paradise, they heard about Ghazan Khan, the king of the world, Ilhan of our time. From their celestial abode, they rushed here to fulfill their desires and kiss the threshold of his court. You can see how literary imagination, the representation of an actual army of beautiful soldiers who are now summoned to pay homage to the emperor, to the Mongol Ilkhanid emperor of the time, is something that brings poets together and shows the continuity, right, in the way that, that this, this, this lyric excerpts were, were created and circulated. So this is, this is the general framework in which, that's why I say, Let's be very careful. I will never talk about Sadi's homosexuality. I will never talk about homosexuality as an identity in this case, but we can see how blurred these, 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 these categories can be and how the scope of same-sex desire can be reflected in different ways uh, throughout these works. The main focus, eventually, is the act of contemplating beauty. So whatever angle we choose to take to uh, study the relevance of Sadi's aesthetics, especially in the direction of same-sex desire, the focus on the importance of contemplating beauty, the importance of admiring beauty for different ends, it could be physical, carnal, sexual, or spiritual, or both at the same time, is, 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 is key here. So um, Sadi says, this is how I am. I cannot resist the allure of beautiful faces. I sell hypocrisy to no one, and I don't pretend to be a pious ascetic. Darman im has kesabram zemikurion nis, zark na porusham or zohti manemoyam kan nis. You see the countenances and refrain from contemplating. I admire your strength, as I don't have such endurance. Eike manzur bebi mio tamol nakoni, yar toro o bate im has maro en kan nis. It is virtuous to reject the sin that the Turkic beauties may pose. But what remedy for this sinful gazer who has no control over his carnal soul? Tarke hubane chatao ein savabas bali ken chekonad bande ke bar nafse chodash armanis. No more will I admire the valleys adorned with beauty, 
for not all fragrant gardens display a rose as beautiful as your cheek. Man digar made be sahra o tamasha na konam. Be goli hamchu rofe to be hame bo san nis. I see a fairy in your visage, an angel in your countenance, and good manners. Listen, anyone who cultivates no affection for you cannot be human. Ei pari ruye malak surate ziba sirat. This is a spiritual, aesthetic anthropology. Beauty, the act of vision, the act of admiring beauty, constitutes the essence of mankind or humankind, according to Sadi. And around this, everything, all, all, everything is, is, is a consequence of, of, of this act of, of, of desiring to one's eyes. So many people are blind, even with, even with their eyes wide open. They resemble soulless paintings depicted on walls. The references to vision, the references to painting, these ekphrastic references to painting are found throughout, throughout uh, the works of study. It's interesting to see how they inspired later on generations of painters and artists right, to depict this, this kind of images. Or brother, the wayfarer on the path won't have to share the pain of his heart. For this is a pain that is not concealed from you. I know no creature who is not bewildered by the one whose powerful pen bewilders my senses in all. And here we have the spiritual component. So you can see how the whole debate is found among many scholars whether Sadi's poetry is mystical, whether Sadi's poetry is only erotic and physical and mundane, should be mediated through the consideration of how these two poles of the spiritual metaphysical and the physical are deeply, intimately intertwined with each other. So this is important to see that the beloved is not necessarily God. The beloved is not necessarily an actual physical human being, but he's a presence that combines the different aspiration of, of the soul and the body of the beholder. Osadi, your precious life has now come to its end, but the story of your melancholic desire is truly endless. So I focus on the Chabisat because I believe that, which means the obscene poems, which have been neglected, I believe that do shed a different kind of light on the complexity of the act of desiring and beholding beauty in Sadi's poetry. Um, and I really like to show the manuscripts because many of my, among my interlocutors in the past have telling me that, oh, we, it's not, not true. Sadi is such an excellent poet. It's not possible that this Habizat, these obscene poems were his really. So what I can do is just to share the oldest documents in which the Habizat are actually ascribed to Sadi. And I start with, uh, I, I, I try to find also manuscripts that can be can be perused in the UK, especially in London. This is a beautiful uh, Safavid manuscript that, uh, containing Sadi's collected works, the Koliat, uh, copied in 1624 and kept in the British Library. I believe it is accessible uh, if you have good reason. Otherwise, it's fully digitized on the website of the British Library. I really encourage you, if you can read Persian, to take advantage of this wonderful tool that is at disposal, our disposal from anywhere in the world. And you can see here, there is the title of the Chabisat and this brief introduction in Arabic that explains why Sadi decided to write these obscene poems, which is interesting. It's, it's a, and I have here the English translation. He says, the sons of some kings, so some princes, have urged me to compose a book of Fasesh, Fasesh, for them in the fashion of Suzani or Samarkand. Initially, I refused by facing the threat of being executed, I was forced to write these verses. May God forgive me for them. Of course, this is a playful rhetorical strategy and say, I had no choice. So I had to write this, this, this obscene poems for them, for the entertainment of these princes. This is indeed a, a facetious chapter, but the virtuous man should not blame me. A salaciousness in speech is like salt with food. And here goes this jocose book. May God bestow his blessings. There are several poems that are important, right? It's, of, of course, it's, of course we cannot believe that Sadi was forced under, you know, this kind of threat, capital threat to, to write these this poems. But it's interesting to see how, first of all, there is this connection with kingship, 
that we have already analyzed earlier, right? we have already discussed that, just you can see that the courtly environment was, uh, was such that this kind of language could be used as part of, of, of the, of the uh, literary and cultural endeavors of the court, so this connection with these patrons. But it's also interesting to see how the connection with Suzani or Samarkand is made here. Suzani is the most important um, obscene port of pre-modern Iran. He has not been studied. There is a very poor edition, critical edition of his, of his works published many decades ago. There are new manuscripts that have been found now, so times are, are, uh, are right now to, to revisit his poetry. There is only one article published in Italian uh, that has a theological approach to the representation of phallologocentrism in the poetry of, of, um, of Susani Samarcandi by an Italian scholar, uh, Riccardo Zipoli, who teaches in Venice. And it's interesting, Sadi says, I am attaching myself to this tradition. So this is the kind of poetry that I'm looking at to revisit the, the tradition of, of, of erotica. So, and we can see how, what kind of language that he uses, right? And when the fuckers bring you their cocks as an offer, as soon as you look elsewhere, they pound your ass deep and hard. What is interesting is that in this tradition, it is important to create new speech, new lyrical speech, new poetry by respecting the authors who preceded you. So this very poem is nothing but a response to a lyric love poem by an older poet whose name was Sanayev Ghazni, which is the first important lyric poet of Iran. Uh, of the, like when I say Iran, I mean the Iranian world, the Persian speaking, the Persian world, right? Not just Iran as a nation today. So now you is a is a beautiful city in Afghanistan today. If the lovers come to you to offer their souls as their most precious gift, right? So you see how here, this is the way that Sanai opened this beautiful love, courtly, elegant, high register uh, description of, of love. And Susani used the same rhyme, the same meter, the same imagery, and reconverted right and 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 uh it into into an obscene language it's interesting to see how there is continuity between serious obscene serious texts sort of referring to each other creating this this web of intertextual connections all this lands into sadi's hands in a way that creates a complex architecture literary architecture that the poet used to, to describe what does it mean to think about the body and think about the connection between the soul and the body and use different, the different kinds of forces at work in, in, in the Persian language to describe this connection, to describe the complexity of this, this connection and to describe how this kind of language can also be put at the service of, of an inquiry of a quest of speak, with speech, spiritual ends. It's interesting because Sadis talks about also the importance of, of, um, of Hazel and Habis, an obscene language, and compares it to salt, which is needed in food to appreciate food. So there is a physiological dimension to it as well. So it is a function of the obscene. And I found this is also one of the earliest um, manuscripts um, that is uh, that contains a selection of Sadi's poems and a selection of Susani, Susani's poems. So it's easy to see that he has both. And, and in the introduction of the author of this collection of poems, this was copied most likely during the first two decades of the 14th century, according to the style and uh, the weight and, and, uh, and the script, the style of the script. Uh, it was most likely also based, copied on the basis of a manuscript that was copied when Sadi was still alive, or only two or three years after Sadi's death. Sadi died in 1292. So it's interesting to see that there is this continuity. And the author here says he wants to explain why he decided to include obscene, obscene lines in this collection of poems from different authors, including Sadi and Susani. And he says, Obscene and serious poetry has Rajid, 
equalize nature's uneven alternation of contractions and dilata dilatations. Whenever readers are under the pressure of contractions, they may find relief in the levity of the obscene, whereas serious poetry may offer relief from excessive dilatation. Um, my dear colleague and friend, Justine Landau, wrote a beautiful book in French, The Rhythme de Raison, in which she describes uh, the, the role that the physiology of contraction and dilatation had in 13th century meditations on the role of poetry and the role of attracting audiences and impacting your audiences through poetry in a, a physiological fashion. Even. So it's, I refer to that work and I, I connect to what she does also through this, this door at the end of, of my book. So what I try to see is a beautiful manuscript. Um, I, I relied extensively on it. It's, it's kept in, uh, in Kabul, it's, uh, the National Archives of, of Afghanistan. It's interesting to see how, um, this is one of the oldest uh, copies also of Sadis Poliat, the so-called pre bisotun recension. We can talk about this later. You see also the introduction is here, with other Khalisat. To me, it's interesting to see them, the um, Sadis obscene poems not as a provocation, not as a subversion, but as a set of counter texts to his serious lyric output. So to see how two registers communicate and are in touch with each other, exploring the role of the body through language under different angles and different kinds of light. Uh, and the role that the imagination had also in this. How do we make sense of the imagination in that sort of very liminal space between the ideal depiction of beauty and the acknowledgement of one carnal desires. How do we move between these two realms? How do we tame carnal desire? How do we understand what the meaning of carnal desire can be? Uh, and so he has this beautiful fragment in which he says, hope is a dream with your intoxicating eyes. Too restless I am to sleep, sleep well and tight. How could I be fulfilled by just looking at you? Other actions I had in mind, but none of them can I say to you. And here you see that the limit, you can see the, the, the border, right? The, the margin between these two possibilities of saying the obscene or thinking about the obscene. And then you can convert this obscene, this, this sexual um, energy into something that can take completely different twists. Um, you can see how this is um, another beautiful point. You can see also how Sadiq plays with the lyric tradition and creates expectations that he uh, constantly um, frustrates in the reader. So you, you can see how there is this, this way of playing with the, with the language of love, of, of the lyrical tradition, how delightful it is to contemplate the handsome idol of mine, my Cyprus, who brings life to my days and cherishes my soul. I used to travel across the world, but now my love for his hair keeps me stuck in this city. Everyone enjoys life with their own companion, my companion is hung as tall as I am. And you can see from this line, he starts sort of manipulating the tradition and he adds a new kind of discourse. What I love the most is to sit into his ass, the most cherished limb among the limbs of my body. I'm content with his manners. His sweat is a source that never satisfies my thirst. I admire the temperance of this mystic. All right, won't my erection deserve resurrection? I'm very proud of this line because, because it's, it's a tricky in the original Persian. So I try to respect the, 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 the puns that are found in the Persian uh, between uh, uh, erection and resurrection in connection with the Aref. The Aref is the spiritual beholder, is the mystic. There is a whole tradition in, uh, in the context of Sufi, Islamic and Persian Sufi thought. Uh, and the Aref is the person, is the mystic who recognizes that nothing exists but God. In Sadi's poetry, the Oref acquires a different aesthetic nuance. The Oref is the person who admires beauty and understands that all beauty derives from divine beauty. So there is no denial, there's no way to deny the importance of admiring the world and the mundane aspect of life, but everything has to make sense. Everything has to, has to be put at the service of the contemplation of the divine. Even when 
eroticism and sexual desire are involved. Like this slide is this line is, is one of the most beautiful examples of this connection between the spiritual and the erotic. On the page-like cheek of the beautiful ones, they see the downy beards. Short is their sight, but the beholder contemplates the pen of God's creation. Here there is a pun. In Persian, he says, Chash mikuta nazaran barvarat surat kuban khat hamidinado are talame sone khodara. Here, khat means two things in Persian. Can mean the uh, writing, act of writing, scripture or script, but also the beard that appears on the face of a beautiful young man. Uh, and what Sadi is saying is that everyone is looking at beauty, everyone looks at the beautiful faces, but only the RF, only the mystic can understand that the face that everyone covets is nothing but a page on which God has inscribed the power of his act of creation. So you can see how these, these two elements come together through this pun. And then the following line, Sadi says, everyone's eyes peruse your face with so much passion, but the self-worshippers discern no difference between truth, uh, truth and lust. Right? So between happy gap and have uh, So you can see how the sexual component is never denied, is always here. And Sadi's to his language tries to approach it from different angles, from different points of view, because the final, the final goal of the mystic, the final goal of the spiritual beholder is to polish the mirror of his heart. So the human heart in this tradition, and this is what I focus on in the second part of my book, chapter, chapters four through eight, human heart acts like a mirror that is naturally capable of reflecting the unseen, the invisible world. So I look at the Avicennian cosmological paradigms, how it was translated into um, Sufi language by author such as Ghazali. I will not linger to this, but the body, along with its carnal passions and external perception, veils the heart and prevents it from visualizing the supernal realm of the unseen. So you can see how, while spiritual poetry tries to give a name, represent this unseen, strives to make sense of the Theoerotic elements that, that filter through the quest for the unseen. Obscene poetry focuses on the heart, focuses on that very veil, focuses on the rust that covers the mirror. And what is the connection between the rust and the mirror and the surface of the mirror? This is the, the wonderful secret that obsesses um, the, the entirety of Sadi's um, work. So there are different, different strategies. It's interesting to see how Sadi's poetry, there is the act of contemplating beauty to see the signs of God, the sacred eroticism through the term of Shahed Bazi, if you heard about this term. Uh, so Shahed means witness, by extension, the witness of divine beauty. So the beautiful boy who reflects divine beauty. There is this all imaginal cosmological also dimension, dreams, spiritual training, some are sexual. So listen to music, listen to erotic poetry, set in music. These are all elements that help the believer understands the connection between physical desire and the quest for the invisible, the unseen. And I conclude with this. This is this is a beautiful. Before I read the text for you, please let's focus for one second on on, on this image. This is again from uh, uh, this manuscript kept in the British Library, and I believe this is the only or the first visual presentation of one of Sadi's obscene works. So it's interesting to see that it's something that is not really common. You don't really find it uh, in the manuscript tradition. And this is the story with which Sadi opens the Khabisat, with which he opens these obscene lines, which whose protagonist is, is, is an RF, is a, is a mystic, is a spiritual beholder. And uh, the story is, I translate all the first few lines, it's a long story. A mystic cast the eye of his heart upon a face who could not stop desiring his beautiful hair. He was a strong boy, a seductive wrestler. He could break chains with his strength alone. The mystic strove for, for a few days until the night he sat in private with the young man. He caressed the musky apple of his face and gave him kisses and as sweet as peaches. He wanted to get inside the boy's pants and let his arrow plunge after the cock feather. The cock feather I discovered is the final part of, a, of an arrow. I, I, that's how it's called. It's a 
uh, Sufar in Persian. So, and, and then the story goes on. It's, it's, I, I really urge you to read the rest of the poem if you can read Persian. Um, but it's interesting to see how the RF here is on the side of lust. So the last full aspect of the quest for, for divine beauty in these experts is, is, is brutalized, is subverted countertextually. So you can see how that aspect is, is, is in now the main focus of, of the quest. And, and uh, this is another poem uh, in which Sadi says, how beautiful it is to offer one's heart to a beloved, a moon-faced beauty so graciously not noble and elegant, his delicate feet wearing manly sandals on his head, a coarse hat in the fashion of muleteers, a beardless boy whose chest is wrapped in a uh, woolen cloth, is much more handsome than a girl covered by the veil. Girls need gold, fine garments and ornaments to entice the passion of their husbands. Many ornaments are needed to beautify their bodies. A masky mole and a fine and dark downy beard won't suffice. The brides of paradise cover their heads with veils. I love hemp garments on a beauty's chest. Better than me, no one can describe how the tunic closes and opens from behind the neck. When a boy lays his silver chin on the ground, the bed is an ornament in full display. Calmly young men, Shahed, are all that the city needs, no more than one sun out to shine upon a country. The kings sleep over verandas, manzar, that overlook beautiful vistas. The veranda of the mystics, or Efan, is the back of a beautiful boy. So you can see here how all the different elements, kingship, the difference between genders, the ungendered nature, of love in Persian poetry, right? Because in many Ghazals, we cannot really recognize whether a poet is talking about a man or, or, or a woman, and how these, this, from this ungendered depiction or idealized desire, the gendered presence of, of, of young men emerges as a direct connection with one's physical appetites and how these physical appetites inhabit the relationship between mystics and kings. Right, so you can see how all this comes to a close and sort of creates a full circle through which we can contemplate the different refractions of, of Sadi's quest for beauty. And I'm, I will stop here. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Roya, for being so patient. And yeah, I'll be happy to you know, hear comments or respond to questions if you have questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. You, you gave us so much in such a short time. Thank you for that. Um, the, I can see there's one question and while more people ask their questions, I had something to ask you because Please. talking to Jane Lewis and who we know was the wife of Lenny Lewis and God rest his soul, she mentioned something about Jamal Parasti, which is sort of the worship of beauty, which is yes. something that you've mentioned more than once. And when we think about this idea of the beardless, beautiful boy who is more beauteous than a veiled woman, it makes me think about the pederasty, which we found in Greek ancient style, where, as a matter of fact, the idealized idea of love was this romance between an older and a younger. And in both situations, we have the domus and the more public life, where women were behind a wall. So one wonders how much this sort of gendered walls in these societies where men didn't have access, because it literally, for you to read to us, beardless boy more handsome than a girl in a veil. It just reminds me of that whole idea of whether we can make some connections between this love of beauty, lack of access to the female, and therefore this idealized beautiful young boy becomes this soft creature. And how connected we can make that to ideas of homosexuality, gay or lesbian love as such? It's a very interesting question. It's a fascinating, complex problem. Uh, it seems to see, again, how sexual identity is, is, when we talk about sexual identity and sexual orientation in its cases, uh, as I was mentioning in the beginning of the talk, uh, it's something that is much more fluid than we would ever imagine. And it frames the perception we have of body, of the body, we frame the perception we have of desire along lines that reflect also different social conformation, different social orders. So what is interesting, I think that in this context, what really makes boys more appealing 
for this kind of description is not a quintessential quality, it's not a quintessential superiority when compared to, to women, but it is the possibility of flirtatious exchanges. It's the possibility of, having, of being in touch with, with people of the same sex and having this kind of conversations in which friendship leads into homosexuality. Homosexuality can lead into intergenerational desires, right? Whereas the connections between men and women by default are regulated by very specific social norms in which this kind of playful interplay can, could not really uh, take place um, and uh, unless these social norms are broken. Now in other genres, such as the epic romance, um, I think of the Book of Kings, the Shahnameh by Ferdowsi, I think of all the beautiful uh, long poems, narrative poems by Nezami Ganjavi, like uh, Khosro Shirin, Lelo Majnun, um, Aftekar. We do see how these rules can be broken. And this is why in those cases, for the sort of the purpose of the specific aesthetics, gendered aesthetics that are work in those in, in that genre, love is usually something that happens between a man and a woman. But the main focus in this case is how what happens if we break these social norms. Whereas in the in the lyric tradition, the social norms are representing a completely different along a diff, completely different line. So you can have the same poet who praises man to woman, woman to man kind of desire to one specific genre. At the same time, the same poet could write an homoerotic nasal because the genre demands a different way of reflecting and describing the, the connection between same-sex bodies and same-sex uh, attraction, right? So th th these are completely different ways of approaching this problem. And it's interesting to see how um, in other traditions also, as you mentioned, this kind of connection was found. Now, I do not think that there is an exact, precise line of continuity between, you know, historically between you know, Greek love and the way that this is framed. Right? I think that there is there is there are different peripheral influences until a canon took shape and it became the main way to describe desire in the lyric context. So this is how. Um, and it, what fascinates me is how important role of women as authors was in, 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 uh, in reflecting and also modifying the canon. As I was mentioning earlier, also Jahan Malik Khatun was a woman, the first important female poet of, of pre-modern Iran. We have a, a large divan collection of poems that survives, has been published a few years ago in Iran. Some, some scholars are working and translating the poems, Dick Davis, uh, the, Dick Davis translated the selection of his poems. Uh, Dominic Brookshaw, in his beautiful book on Hafez Shirazi, published two years ago, also has talks and, and describes like, her interactions with a, a number of poets who were active in Shiraz during the same century. It's important to see how the interaction between biography, um, biological sex, and cultural representations, and aesthetic ideals interact with each other. So this is interesting to see how, it is interesting for our conversation about LGBTQ identities today, because it shows at the time in which we start talking more seriously about non-binary identities, we talk about fluidity of desire and gender, we can learn a lot from other cultures, other sort of literary contributions in the way that sex and gender is not something that is fixed in one form in all cultures, but can fluctuate right across the centuries and, and in different traditions. So this is the main point that one can you know, meditate upon when, when reading yeah. Persian classics. Yeah, but absolutely. I think this is a really interesting topic for future conversations is looking at LGBTQ presence in various cultures and societies in literary form. Now, I've got to start by saying happy birthday. Yorgos you. Dides has very specifically said happy birthday. <laughs> Thank you. 21 again, I can say, I can tell. <laughs> um, actually, tying in with sort of what you were talking about of context and seeing the gender context and various uh, social places where these poets emerge. 
First of all, Susan Babai, uh, Dr. Professor Babai, thanks you for your wonderful talk and says, I wonder if the particularity of such poetics of desire are specifically tied with urban life, urbanity, uh, urbanity. What one imagines was life in Shiraz of Saadi's life. Do you detect such links in his Khabisa? This is interesting. It's, um, it's a very good question. Um, it's, it's interesting because the first mentions of homoerotic desire in the Persian literary tradition are connected to the martial arts, to the martial sphere of warfare, battlefield, the ideal of in connection with the courtly environment. So the very, very first description of these beautiful Turks from Central Asia who could pour wine and, and the like, the, the, the eyes of, 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 the, of, the, of, of the people of the court, and at the same time, the day after, be uh, proud fighters on the battlefield, right? So it's interesting to see how this, this, this element that is, 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 is precedes Saadi by three or four centuries. Um, I believe that the, 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 the urban environment signals the transition from the court as a sort of, as a, as a, as a sphere that is the same independent from the society. It's time to a moment in which probably during the soldier period, during the revival of the importance of networks of cities, of centers of education throughout the Persian speech, throughout the Islamic world, throughout the Eastern mm -hmm. Islamic world, the, 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 the creation of, of, of universities such as the Nizamiya, Create different kinds of exchanges in which cities, yes, became the new pole of attraction, right? So, and the, also the connection between different circles of different different kinds of, of scholars, of of of, uh, of um, traders, of of, uh, of of poets, and 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 um, rich families, right? That were revolving around uh, the courts. And so creating these more fluid interactions among, among different social classes. So this is, yes, this is reflected in Sadi's work. Sadi's, especially in the Golestan, explores the, 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 the cultural anthropological richness of, of this new landscape at the verge of the collapse, right? The verge of the Mongol disasters are even more interesting, right? How Sadi's reflects about, about the importance of living in urban spaces admiring beauty and finding a golden mean of conduct in the urban space, so urbanity as a, as a new ideal that appears specifically when cities were collapsing and being destroyed by, by the Mongol, by Mongols. And then Saadi also witnesses the new Renaissance, the Mongol Renaissance of the Khanid Empire. He collaborates into the aesthetic development of this, of this new core, historical course, right? With the, attaching himself to the Jolini family, the Sohaib Divan, who was working for the Ilkhan at the time. So you see also how Sadi shows the importance of sexuality and desire in the, um, in the downfall and resurrection of these urban spaces, specifically in Shiraz. Wow. Um, now we have from Spencer Pennington. Uh, you have mentioned in some of your talks about Sadi the importance of a distinction between seeing Saadi as a poet who employed mystical language versus seeing Saadi as a mystic who was also a poet. Can you say more about this distinction, especially since here you highlight Saadi's writing as counter the mystical lyric? Yes, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, there is a, in Persian, this distinction is between the shair -e -are and the aref -e shair. -e. Right. So the mystic, the Sufi, who also writes poetry in order to, to disseminate right, the, the, doc, the, the, the doctrine, the, 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 the faith and the, 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 the points of, of that belong to the belief of, of a specific Sufi order or another. The poet who relies on Sufism is a poet like Sadi, who does not embrace one specific order even though he had a lodge for himself, even though he was part of these circles, but he relies on poetic language 
to explore the spiritual possibilities of the literary canon and how these spiritual possibilities need to rely on eroticism as well, need to rely on praise poetry for patrons as well. So it's interesting to see how the, the, the main difference is between the RF, the, the, the spiritual beholder or the mystic who decides to, to um, incorporate the entirety of his world within his own spiritual quest and the poet who describes, who, who discovers the importance of being active in the world and seeking the truth or the divine presence and the divine splendor throughout a, 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 a number of different experiences and experiencing all of this through different ways of, of composing poetry. So this is the main difference. It's an aesthetic difference. It's a difference in terms also of, of circles and how a poet like Seti could be active in different circles and not just limit himself to the, to the realm of, of the Sufi Lodge, but use the Sufi Lodge also to create these connections. And, and, uh, and this is described extensively by all historical reports that, that you know, talked about Sadi and Sadi's acti activities in, in Shiraz at the time. And, and again, the Hispanic jurics, the Casides, the political poems and the Habisat, the obscene text, open small windows into something that is otherwise unstudied and uh, cannot be recognized if we just limit ourselves to what he says in the Golestan and in, in his Hazals. So this, uh, you've mentioned the idea of power and sexuality in a very powerful way. You showed that there is some connection there. Uh, Pearl Sharalambos asks, in what do you ways do you think Foucault's view of power and sexuality overlap with how power is used as erotic communication in these poems? It's, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's absolutely, it's the main, I believe that we, if we were to rewrite the history of sexuality in, 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 13th, in 13th century Iran, the Foucauldian approach will be the main tool that you know, will come to my mind in order to explore that. So this is extremely important. Um, in my next, in another book project, I'm, I, I, I would like to work on, um, on the Ghaznavid period, so two centuries before Sadi, and see how power and eroticism are so interconnected. And I have actually the first chapter of my book deals with this, and I try also to make use to an extent, not too extensively, to, to Foucault to, to make sense of, of these power dynamics and how desire is not something that relates to a modern way of seeing, looking at individuals who desire other individuals, but as something that belongs to structures of power. Okay, and then also taking this uh, sort of the homoerotic theme of the sexual desire you speak of, Manuela Granlalti, I do apologize if I get anybody's name wrong, forgive me. She says, thank you for a very interesting talk. And she wonders to what extent homoerotic desire is also present in other genres, say epic, or whether the lyric is a privileged space for it. And if so, what gives that special possibility to the lyric? The wonderful question, yes. Um, homoerotic desire, it's interesting. It does, it, it, desire, the gender of desire is usually, um, is should carried on by the genre, the epic. Until the 14th century, is mostly heteroerotic. I don't really like the word heteroerotic or homoerotic because it really frames discourses and bodies and desires according to modern categories. But same sex uh, uh, is 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 mainly found in the genre, the lyric of the fragment at a durobai. Right, the quatrains, not in the epic. Right, um, things change after the 14th centuries, or 14th century for different reasons. Probably also under the influence of of Sadi, and the way Sadi brings same-sex desire to a different kind of discourse in connection with the spiritual. Uh, the lyric, why is the, the the lyric is is interesting. Scars try to. To define what lyric is 
as a genre and you know it keeps escaping our definitions there is a beautiful book by Jonathan Culler published a few years ago theory of, of the lyric in which he tries to emphasize how across all cultures across all literary traditions the lyric is always this uh, in between space between experience and fiction so there is this idea of think of when we listen to a pop song we know that that song does not talk about the singer does not talk about the desires of the writer the person who wrote the song it does not really talk about our life but we somehow adopt that kind of feelings and we we reflect on what it means and that's why we like a song and then we move on to another song because our poetry works in a similar way this is the pop of of, of medieval iran and um it's 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 fluid it's um, ungendered in principle, linguistically. Uh, it, 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 it creates an impression of sincerity, of, of um, confessionality, of experience by using the most artificial language that one could ever think of. So it's interesting to see how the peak of literary creation invention coincides with the peak of a perceived intimacy through the language. So it's easy to see how this, and this, this is why this, the contrast between these two aspects generates uh, seduction, generates seduction within the language. So the language is plastic enough, is fluid enough, and can be repeated constantly in a way that maybe could be applied to the kind of connections that people would have with younger men of the same, you know, the same sex in, in this sort of constant erotic communication, regardless of whether any physical acts would take place or not. What really matters is the eroticism that is expressed through and inside the language. And I think that Ghazal, for his, his, for his characteristics, is the best genre to express that kind of fluid interactions. Thank you for that. Now, on a more broad sort of subject, Zahra Sabri asks us first, thank you for your amazing talk. Could you speak a bit about how modern reception of these poems has been in the Persian speaking world and how critics have analyzed and reacted to these poems? It's interesting. First of all, the homoerotic aspect of studies poetry has been completely neglected and denied by generational scholars in Iran and uh, in the West for, you know, for obvious reasons that even before, the, 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 before 1979 and, and, and the Islamic uh, regime in Iran. Um, specifically, the Khabisat, there's no critical edition of these poems. They have been published in Iran several times, surprisingly so. But of course, the key words starting with the cough are censored. So we have just thoughts that, that show us, but it's easy to guess what, what specific uh, anatomic detail is being described. Uh, but there's no real critical study uh, of these. There are very few publications. Um, again, what I mentioned by uh, Ricardo Zipoli, uh, Paul Sprachman also wrote a few books on the sort of obral, you know, role of obscene works in the in the in the Persian tradition. Uh, I'm currently trying to I'm working on a critical edition of Sadi's so praise poems and obscene fragments. Uh, but the general reflection, uh, uh, the general um, reaction has been just mainly denial, lack of interest, and and um, even it's interesting. For instance, when I when I published my book last year, and there was this final round of edits and 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 comments from the from the uh, editorial board of the book series among whom scholars whom i respected very much also share their very insightful comments uh, that helped me publish the book eventually of course and and one of the comments was why should we why should we compare obscene poetry with Sadi's serious gazals. Why, you know, why do we, it's not, Sadi was not, Sadi was not sitting down and writing and thinking about the connection between the obscene and the spiritual necessarily. And my response to that said, of course, but this is our work as, as critics to, to see these connections and to, so to see how, 
at a symbolic level, language is being portrayed, is portraying different ways of approaching reality and how they are connecting to each other. So the dismissive approach to the Habisat is something that prevents us from seeing the entirety of Sadi's lyric project. And the more we want to discover what the importance of his spiritual um, contributions were, the more we need to look at this sort of peripheral spaces, right? Or this, 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 this spaces that they've been denied and neglected because they open other kinds of windows onto, onto, onto the onto the work of this poet as a whole. So this is this is how why it's important also to keep alive. I, I don't like to use I don't like to use erotic or for pornographic, but this is pornographic. This is porn, this is obscene. This is something that it was represented and seen as obscene and pornographic. Why should we purify the way we describe this, right? We, it, it, it is what it is. And it is the explicit, at times vulgar, at times vulgar and lyrical and poetic depiction of sec explicit sexual acts and and, and body parts. And you know, there is no, we should not veil this as a, it's, it's, there's nothing to be ashamed of. Well, that's good to know, because that's why we have you here to take off the veil. Um, Khalil Rahman asks, just in brief, how many poems or couplets have obscenity in them of his collection? In terms of, uh, in the very specific corpus of the Habisat, it's about 50, between 50 and 70 poems. If 50 to 70. 50 and 70, yes, depending on the manuscript. Mm -hmm. And then also following from that, is it, uh, Yorgos asks us, is it the case that the Khabisat are always gathered in the Kitab section or are they dispersed in different copies of his divan? If the latter, is that significant? A good question. Thank you, Thank you Yorgos. Um, um, it, it, the first manuscripts that we, the oldest manuscript of Sadi's works, or the mention actually, or the very first manuscripts, we don't really have those manuscripts, but the very first descriptions of how Sadi's work, works were circulating. Um, and these descriptions were composed around the 1320s or 1330s, so a few decades after Sadi's death. They mentioned that the Habisak were found at the very beginning of the book, of the Kaliyat. So they were part of the project. It was a book project opening with the study stuff, which is interesting. And then copists, authors of different recensions of studies, decided to put them at the end of the book. Is that is, you know, we should not open the book <laughs> with this very <laughs> disturbing pieces. But it's easy to see how in some, I, I think the study uh, crafted different ideas of what his collected works were, according to the patrons or to the Sufi lodges or to the spiritual masters with whom he was in conversation and so sort of creating different ways of composing and putting together editing his own works. Uh, that's why we also have different names, different titles for the specific collections of Ghazals. And I think that he was, for some reason, to, especially toward the end of his life, very keen to show that Habisat was his legitimate work. And even in some cases, like is mentioned by this guy called Bisotun, um, they would appear at the very opening of the of the book of the collected poems. And, and, and then the tradition decided that it would be better to be put at the end. They were also circulating. I'm not familiar with many manuscripts in which the Habisat were circulating uh, independently. Only a few collections in which there were there was a selection of poems by Sadi. The Habisat was also seen as, as a sample, like the manuscript that was showing earlier. Later on, I'm not, I don't really know whether the 16th and 17th centuries they were circulating alone. It's what I've seen, especially during the 14th and 15th centuries, early 16th centuries, they were always appearing as part of the Koliath, as part of the collective poems. I think also we have to be really careful when we think about dissemination and use in the ancient world, where we find things as an archeologist I found doesn't always tell us where it was used and consumed. So consumption and dissemination are things that we really don't know enough about, do we? But really interesting question that from Iskandar Din, would you say that the preference for the visible young man over the invisible veiled woman that defines the poetic obscene constitutes a subversive order 
that stands in direct generic construct, uh, contrast with the pursuit of the invisible, the divine, the ghaib, at the expense of the visible, mundane, dunya, that marks the sacred poetic, the poetic sacred, therefore representing the contrast between bast vaqabs, would the two sides of the coin be essential to the literary life of the era in question? I believe so. Thank you for this question, uh, Iskandar John. Um, I, I do believe I do agree with you. It's um, it's a bit difficult to frame this as a as a theory uh, because we need more text. We need to study more the tradition. We need to see more you know in depth what the role. Uh, between gender, between sexes could imply. But I do see whenever Sadi brings up the figure of the RF and the difference between genders is something that does create some sort of connection with, with, with this problem, the quest of the relationship between the visible and the invisible. And, and um, the, um, the seemingly apparently disparaging lines about female beauty are interesting because they also belong to a tradition in which, unfortunately, the female body is, is represented as, as the ultimate uh, vessel of materiality, of physicality, as opposed to the soul and the higher spiritual of the soul. So it seems to see how the contractual exchange between men and women responds to different needs, different social mundane needs, whereas the appreciation of male beauty in this context can, even when explored in such an explicit way, can somehow um, offer a way to rebalance the connection between the soul and the body. This is something that comes up a lot in Sadi's poetry, but it would be interesting also to compare this with, with uh, the greatest sat satirist of, of pre-modern Iran, Obed Zakani, who flourished one century after Sadi, and who was influenced by Sadi's Khadisat and created a new encyclopedia almost of obscenities at this time. And he was also in touch with, in connection with Hafez and Dharma. So you need to see how these meditations also created, generated different strands of thoughts between the 13th and 14th centuries. But yes, what you say, Skandar, is absolutely right, I think. But it deserves to be explored further. further. And taking this idea of gender, Jane Lewison asks us, does the female, does the way female poets writing in the Ghazal tradition uh, treat this, uh, how do they treat the subject of desire? She mentions Rabia Bint, Azadeh, Mehran Nisa, Bibi Hayati, Mahasti Ganjavi, Jahan Malik. How do these female sort of views of desire and treatment of it in poetry differ from the poets such as Hafez and Sadi and Rumi? The, um... In the scholarship, apparently there is no difference. So in the way that scholars until now have tried to make sense of the way the women were introducing her, the, themselves into the canon uh, is usually studied without really trying to signal the presence of any real differences. But I do think that there are differences and I do think that there is on the one hand, the anxiety of being recognized as part of the canon. So writing in a way that sounds manly, sounds, seems to be aligned with the male biological presence of the bodies who are composing that poetry, right? So this is the problem that Jamal Khatun frames for the first time explicitly in the introduction that she wrote for her divan. On the other hand, there are elements that can be that should be studied, and we, we need to we need to find new theoretical tools, new paradigms to, to understand how gender difference, how sex difference, sexual difference could inform different ways of, 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 of writing. But what is interesting is this this this, which is evident in, in, in Jahan more than anyone else, really, is this desire to recognize. As, as an equal, as a man. So they, they, that her, her um, innermost sphere and in the way she describes it was to, to be seen as a, as a woman. And in fact, for instance, her detractors described her poetry as, as something that was, was the product of her vagina. 
by saying that her poetry smells like her vagina, this is what we're saying, but not say, denouncing the fact that she pointed the finger toward the father. We know that you, what your fear is. We know how to get to you. You don't want us to believe that a woman can write poems as beautiful as the Ghazals written by her male counterpart. So it's interesting, and it's an interesting question. Thank you, Jane, for, for asking this, but we need to work more on this as a, to, to, you know, to understand better what kind of dynamics were at work at the time. That really breaks my heart, actually, because there should be a more direct answer to that of, well, we've looked at Rabbi and she talks more about compare sex to birds, or that I would have hoped there would have been something beyond her vagina smells like her poetry, which is a flowers, incidentally, ladies and gentlemen. So um, there's also uh, what we want to know, Sadi, okay. Um, as Sina Fakul asks us, first says thank you, then says, do we know about the social context of Shahid Bazi at the time of Sadi? Sadi has declared in some verses that he is accused by others of doing Shahid Bazi. Can this be understood as an awareness for a certain sexual identity or practice? Very good question. Excellent question. Yes, this is interesting because the homoerotism was, was a symbolic element in the in the contents of the Darbar, like the court, but also the Sufi Lodge. And there were different ways of praising or repressing same-sex desires in the, in the spiritual context. So there, we cannot think of Sufism as a, as a static, as a monolithic entity. We had different trends, different ways of also referring to previous Sufi masters adopting their ideals and their eth eth ethics, but somehow readapting those to different social situations. And so from what I can glean from the sources, from what other poets, other, from what historians said about Sadi, from later Sufi masters said about Sadi, from what Sadi wrote about himself, I do believe that Sadi had a, a different kind of inclination, um, that would put him more, I do think that there is more of an identity taking shape in Sadi, in the way Sadi looks at same-sex desire. I cannot, I, I try, and I struggle because I try not to talk in terms of identities and I stay away from the discourse on identity, but the way that he describes the physical uh, structure of the beloved is not seen lines. You, you, the beloved is, becomes more of an adult, and we know that in this context, same sex is desire, provided that it's intergenerational, so an older man with a younger boy. But Sadi somehow represents this younger boy as, 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 as an adult or as an older um, young man. He, the way he obsesses over the beauty of the beard appearing, and how even though the beard signals marks the end of the erotic tension between the Oshlek and the Mashul. So he lingers into that and says, I still desire you, even though I see hairs growing down there, even though your face is still clean, clean as clean as an apple. Uh, so there, there, is, there is this, this it's, it's interesting. And it's um, other mystics later on said, we tried to talk to Sadi, but he would only talk to beautiful men. He, would, he was not <laughs> interested in our presence when we went to visit him in his Sufi lodge. And he was not really, so um, thank you for this question. It's something one should think about this, this more carefully and, and reinterpreting the meaning of identity according to, a different, to different categories. We cannot really use the same way we talk about identity today, but trying to see how in the repetition of these tropes, the part of the tradition that do not really reflect personal inclinations, one might find from time to time elements that point to historical biographical reality but it's very hard to get there. Um, I want to go back again to this question of gender and poets, because Brian, and by the way, please, anybody who didn't get their questions asked, we have provided uh, Dr. Ingenito's email in the thing, so you can get in touch with him. I'm sorry, because there's such amazing questions, we don't have time to bring all of them. 
Bryony Pierce says, thank you for your amazing talk. You mentioned the place of female poets and gender. In uh, Bakhti poetry, the feminine voice and experience is as important an important aesthetic in which to encounter the beloved, with female poets such as Mirabai, Mirbai being much celebrated, and male poets inhabiting a female persona through which to encounter and submit themselves to the divine. Within Persian poetry, do we see modes of encountering and speaking about the beloved that are from the female perspective? Do we see that in the male poets where the feminine voice is heard? Um, yes, but it's more, it's interesting how critics usually refer to the feminine or the effeminate or the feminine constitution, the feminine aspect of the beloved, the eff effeminized beloved. I think it's, it's our perception as from a Western modern way of creating a separation between the ideal of phys male physical beauty and female physical beauty is not really reflected in the Persian uh, aesthetic ideals. I think that we should even start talking about the third gender when the mashuk, when the beloved is described, because there is no real clear gender, there's no real clear separation between the description of ideal beauty in some texts applied to both men and women. Um, that is, it's interesting because in some cases, for instance, we assume that when the poet talks about the anar-like breast of the beloved, right, the pomegranate-like breast of the beloved, and using this metaphor, we assume that that reflects a female presence. But in some cases, in other literary tradition, we see also, especially in the, in the uh, medieval German lyric tradition, the, the chest of men and women is perceived as something that is not anatomically different from each other. Uh, so the way also culture frame and represent what bodies look like, regardless of their genders, or their, their sexes, is also extremely interesting. So, or the length of the hair, for instance, I have colleagues and friends who told me, look, Sadi here is talking about a boy, he's talking about a woman because he's described the length of his or her hair. And but we see also that the length of the hair doesn't say anything about the gender, the sex, the biological sex of, of the object of desire. So there is this, this idea of a, and um, I will be interested to respond to this question. I don't have the response, but if I were to go deeper in this direction, I would compare the description of women in the, in the epic poems of Nezami, for instance, with his own ghazals and how, whether this description can be, can frame gendered bodies in different ways or not. This would be the way to proceed, I think. Uh, yeah, because I must say, when you have that section about as the penis approaches and the ass, that could just as well have been about a woman. Not trying to be funny, because uh, this, uh, yeah. So we do have we do have a lot of, of ambiguity. Of course, of course. But this is interesting. There is another, this is not something that do not, uh, that I, I addressed in the book. Um, Suzanne, for instance, he has this fragment in which he talks about a man who is having an argument with his wife. His wife tells him, why do you keep having sex with boys? I'm, am I not enough for you? Uh, and he says, no, you know why? She says, well, I have, you know, I have, I, have, I, have both, I have both an anus and a vagina. You can just rely on my anus if you put it that. And he says, no, you have two vaginas, actually. <laughs> so it's interesting to see how anatomy is not the only thing. It's the way that representations of desire are projected into, onto anatomy when genders, when sex, biological sexes are, are described. So this is, this is fascinating. So we need to abandon our modern categories and see how these people were thinking about the body in a different way. Yeah, absolutely. And poetry, patronage, the, situ the context is so important. Justin, on the la last uh, question I'm gonna ask you is quite an intense one. Justine Landau asks, the first, uh, first thanks you and says happy birthday. Uh, she asked the relation of obscenity to has on the one hand and heja satire, political satire on the other, a topic that Zippoli has looked at. In addition, the truly erotic obscene poetry you analyzed 
um, she believes or uh, believes has more satirical ghazals, some of which target people in power as well as women in sexual terms. So can we uh, hear a bit more about other use of obscenity in Saudi? Um, yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Justine, for, for, for these questions. Um, um, so it's interesting. I'm, I'm interested in, 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 um, in comparing Sadi's obscene works with Susanese and the preceding tradition, because I think that Sadi is less interested in satire, in satire than in the obscene exploration of the body for different kinds of purposes and ends. So if the, I do see some satirical um, trusts, but they're never really at persona. They're not directed apparently at specific people. They're more part of a, of a, a general this playful discourse within the language, which connects with the way that he creates this pastiches between high lyrical registers and lower brutal descriptions. Um, it's, 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 I think that Sadi tries to convert the language that was used in satire against opponents, against rivals, for instance, it was very common before him. Um, he tries to elevate that to a different, I think he's creating a new genre somehow. I think he's creating a new genre in which the uh, invective, in which the language, the vulgar language, the invective and the satire is somehow associated with lyricism in ways we didn't really find, we did not really find before him. And he's, he was trying to create, to experiment. But his texts are very unstable, probably also because he was trying to, to, to write and rewrite and think about what could be said as a new, fresh discourse using this kind of language. And he does, he, he, it's, it's clear that he relies all different genres, even in Arabic. And the fact that he writes in Arabic that introduction in Arabic is true. It's, it's clear that he is, is referring to the Mojun tradition, is referring to the Abbasid tradition, is referring to Abu Nuwas. Um, and and um, the, yes, I see that he's more in the line of the pastiche and exper sort of experimenting with different genres and how these different genres can come together and create a new way of, of expressing uh, lyric sentiment, I think. Well, thank you so much for that. And we've done it on time. Uh, thank you all the audience for being with us today. Thank you very much, Aki. Thank you, Domenico and Janita for your brilliant research because I know you've had a really long journey to get here and be able to express yourself. And it's so amazing when we have scholars from different nationalities give their lives over to the Persian literary or other thank traditions. You very much. It really warms our hearts. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to just say that hopefully around May, we're going to invite the wonderful Saman Aras to, to talk to us about his work with transsexual uh, activism uh, and, and actually healing sessions that he does within his theater work. So do keep an eye out for that. And Domenico, thank you again. Thank you thank so much. Thank you very much. much. It was my pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you. For, we have thank a wonderful you. audience today. Thank you so much for organizing this, Roya. Thank you. Aki thank for, for you. managing all the logistics behind this encounter. Thank so you. So thank you, Aki John. Thank you, everybody. Till the next session, which should be in May. We leave you with lots of love and light. And no ruza ali hezar chahar sat khanu ma va agayan gerami Iran o Iran dus. Khoda afes kelimam. Khoda nega. Bye bye. Merci, merci khoda. Orbana.